Good morning. Welcome to the August NTSA Tech Grove Connect webinar. For those of you that have joined us before, you know that we are doing this monthly series in partnership with NTSA to shine a spotlight on the story behind and the team behind the best papers and tutorials from the most recent ITSIC. Today, we are thrilled to be uh, focusing on one of the tutorials on medical simulation, which is obviously what brought you here. I just want to tell you a few things about the Central Florida Tech Grow for those of you that aren't familiar with us. We are a very unique innovation hub stood up in partnership with the Navy, Army, Air Force, and Marine Corps Modeling Training and Simulation Commands right here in Orlando, Florida. This is what we focus on because this is what our customers focus on, which are the four services in addition to Army Futures Command and Army Soldier Dev Center Simulation and Training Technology Center as well. So we have six government customers, which is that's what really makes us unique. We are multi-service and across multiple disciplines, but all in modeling, training, simulation and human performance, which includes medical simulation. We have three goals at TechGrove. That is to grow the defense industrial base and bring companies and researchers from academia into the sector that may not realize all the potential that's here for them to bring their creativity to bear on meeting the needs of our military. Tech transfer, lots of great IP and innovations to move across those barriers from one sector to another. And then finding solutions to problems that our customers give us going out and looking for solutions that exist often in places that they may not have had the opportunity to look before. We do a whole series of events and initiatives and lots of opportunities for you to engage with us like this webinar, but others such as our next major event is our annual Armed Forces Jam coming up in September. And we'd love for you to connect with us, get your smartphone up and click one of those QR codes so you can check us out, follow us on LinkedIn, and you can always reach us at techgrove at ucf.edu. I'll put that in the uh, chat for you as well, because we'd love for you to be part of our community. And with that, we're going to move on to this amazing team behind this tutorial, Medical Simulation. Their bios are all on the event website, so I'm not going to go through those again. This is going to be a information packed, energy packed presentation, as you can imagine, condensing a multi hour tutorial into about 40, 45 minutes wasn't easy. We have some questions that some of you submitted ahead of time that we'll try to get to. And throughout this session, please use the Q&A on the platform here to submit your questions. And our presenters will do their best to answer your questions during the webinar or perhaps afterwards if we can. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Danielle, Roger, and Alyssa. Thank you, Carol Ann. I, you know, I appreciate your asking us to do this. Uh, you can kind of tell from the template we chose to use that we're also doing this tutorial again for ITSIC 2022. So this is what we're showing today is about a third of the tutorial. And so if you wanna know more, there's kind of, twice as much more on all of this that's in the official tutorial, which you can see at ITSIC if you're interested. So Danielle and Alyssa and I have all worked together various places, uh, most notably when we were all at Advent Health at the Nicholson Center, teaching your surgeons, sorry about my dog, teaching your surgeons to do robotic surgery. Um, this is a picture of all of us together, a couple of pictures. Uh, on the one side, you'll see what we look like at ITSIC when we're all dressed at our finest. And on the other side, kind of what we were like when we were at the Nicholson Center uh, working with the surgical robot. So we both have, we all three have experience um, in the defense space and then also in the civilian healthcare space. And that's helped a lot in, in building this tutorial. So it's more broad. All right. So this is an outline this of the presentation as it is at ITSIC. And we have some material from every one of these categories uh, here too. So this is kind of an outline of what we'll be talking about in the next 30, 40 minutes. Um, so for my slides, uh, 
if you don't pay attention to anything, just pay attention to these two slides, this one and the next one, and you'll kind of get a feel for everything else I'm about to say. So I created this timeline that kind of shows how simulation or training devices in healthcare have evolved and emerged over five or six centuries. So initially, um, all training was done on cadavers and animals. And there are lots of classic old paintings that you would find in national museums uh, showing the, the physicians of that time operating on cadavers or animals. You'll see some of those today. So that was the initial simulator, was a cadaver or an animal, live or dead. And then they started making things that today we would call part task trainers, but they didn't have that term back in the 1700s, where they just tried to teach you about one of the functions of the human body. Um, and sometimes they used um, synthetic, not synthetic, but natural materials, wood and rubber and stuff. And sometimes they used the body itself as the materials to build that device. And then they started creating mannequins. Uh, the first modern mannequin appeared in 1911. So that's when I dated it, um, that you would use to teach people how to treat uh, people. And then the, actually the idea of a standardized patient, there's a formal beginning for that. The formal uh, beginning of something that we call standardized patients today happened in 1963 at the University of Southern California. And this is the physician who worked up that whole concept and began promoting it. And now it's pretty universal around the world. Uh, and then there's screen-based simulations. Um, screen-based meaning on a computer. And that term doesn't come from the military community. That's kind of a term that's, that's only used in civilian healthcare training. And then virtual reality, which is more immersive. And finally, AI, there's, there's a lot of AI um, concepts and prototypes out there, but I'm not aware of any that are fielded regularly in existing simulations. Uh, so that's something I think is coming in the future. So if you look at this historical timeline, uh, you can see this evolution. And uh, you can create a taxonomy out of that. So in the military, you know, most simulations are tied to this four piece taxonomy, which is live virtual constructive or gaming. And they try to fit each one of the types of simulations into one of those four categories. Well, in the healthcare or medical simulation, that's not the taxonomy and it doesn't fit as well. Um, there are several that have been proposed, and the one that I like the best, that I think is the most comprehensive, though it still misses a few pieces, is this one by Chinara, which was published in 1913, sorry, <laughs> 2013, that's 100 years after that, um, where she said, you know, most of the training that we do in healthcare uh, with what we call simulators is either done with, for starting at the bottom, a standardized patient, that would be a human, an actor, that's trying to portray the symptoms and the conditions of a certain disease or a certain condition and, and challenging the doctors to figure out what's wrong with him or her. And then part task trainers, which are usually um, separate arms or jaws or faces or lungs, just one part of the body. It's just more convenient to just use that. Um, a virtual reality simulator, and in medicine, and when she wrote this in 2013, anything that was a 3D model that appeared on a computer screen was usually called VR. It didn't matter whether it was immersive or not, um, as long as it was 3D in its own digital space, they, they labeled that VR. And then finally, the human patient simulator or mannequin. And again, the name that she applied in this taxonomy is um, driven by how the condition of things in 2013. And there was one really highly advanced mannequin being sold that was called the human patient simulator. And so that term was used to separate these computerized mannequins from the simple rubber men uh, that you just might be able to carry around. It didn't really do anything. So that's a taxonomy that fits uh, healthcare simulation much better than the LVCG taxonomy. And she also emphasizes that in most training, 
you're usually using a hybrid where you bring in at least two, if not three or four of these. So a training event is usually not just limited to one of these. So from here, I'm going to show some examples of uh, each one of those modalities from the past and then from the present. So you can see how far we've come and also how similar they are. Um, it was very popular for artists to uh, paint pictures of the surgeon teaching using a cadaver. And you saw one on the taxonomy slide. And here's two more. Um, the one on your left is actually by Rembrandt. So it's quite a famous painting where the lead surgeon is showing all those others leaning in, trying to get a view um, what's going on in this uh, cadaver's arm. And then the one on the right, same kind of picture, except the patient is not a cadaver, it's an animal. And uh, rather gruesomely, if you look closely, you can see that that animal is alive and awake. <coughs> Okay, so that's cadavers from the past. This is kind of a cadaver from the present and almost the future. We still use cadavers to do lots of training in healthcare and, and surgery especially. And it's possible to attach those cadavers to a blood pump and have it circulate a red fluid through the veins and the heart and the, <coughs> and the arteries. And that cadaver takes on a much more lifelike appearance when that happens. The tissue all goes from a jaundice yellow looking to a pink fleshy looking thing. And the, the surgeons say that when they're operating that it looks very, very close uh, to real uh, patient tissue. And because the blood is being pumped, it's like pump, 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 it also transfers some of that motion to the heart. So if you get in and look at the heart, it looks like the heart is beating. If you're a thoracic surgeon, it's not exactly right going through the four uh, chambers of the heart, but at least it's active and you can see that the heart is, is doing some work. So that's cadaver, past, present. Um, if you look at part past trainers, uh, this is one that was built in 1740. And this was Benjamin Hoadley trying to explain to up and coming physicians how the lungs work and the role of the diaphragm in collapsing, expanding the lung. And that was that's something that uh, they didn't understand very well. And I would say that um, non-clinical people, they don't understand that very well even to this day. But he's explaining how it works. And you can tell that the, the part that is the lung and especially the part that the diaphragm it doesn't look anything like the real di diaphragm, um, but it, it provides a functionality that helps uh, Dr. Hoadley explain it. So it's, it's functionally correct, though it's not physically correct. So another part has trainer from present. Um, there are websites and catalogs that contain literally hundreds of different part task trainers, uh, devices that give you a something inanimate where you can practice intubating, um, practice doing ultrasound. I think that's ultrasound needle insertion, uh, where you can practice doing CPR. You're probably familiar with that. And then the, the military versions where you're applying a tourniquet to cut off bleeding. So those um, part task trainers are extremely prevalent in the hundreds of different devices now. And I, I said earlier, this is the first modern, not the very first mannequin, but the first modern mannequin. Um, it was developed by Margaret Chase and she named her first doll Josephine. So it's Josephine Chase is the name of the doll in the rocking chair there. And she brought it into Hartford Hospital in Connecticut so that she could teach nurses in training how to lift a patient, how to turn a patient, how to change the sheets under a patient, um, where to look for a pulse. Uh, they talk about where um, flushing might happen, um, things like that, that didn't require the mannequin to be alive and breathing and all the fancy things we look at or look for today. Um, but she started that in 1911. And there's some really interesting um, advertisements that she put in newspapers and medical publications back then trying to sell it. 
you, you can see those at the Yitzhak tutorial. This, these are more modern mannequins. Um, there are still just mannequins that are made out of silicone and rubber, and they don't do anything but give you a weight to lift and turn, and they're very inexpensive. Um, but we're all fascinated with the ones that are more animated and that have a heartbeat, they breathe, they might have a pulse in their arm, they, their eyes dilate and blink. Um, you can intubate them, you can give them injections, and some of them you can draw blood from, or they can extrude blood if that's the injury. So they're very, very fancy. And uh, you can see one of these. I, this is actually a marketing photo of the little boy sitting up in the bed, uh, found on one of the product's website. And I just found the, the blue eyes looking at the doctor to be kind of creepy, <laughs> like, right? Like Chucky. All right. Uh, past and modern mannequins. And then there's standardized patient training. Um, the, the patient might just walk in and put on a gown and have acted um, out their part. So there's nothing actually there that is that shows. Like they might not have a rash or when you listen to their breathing, you can't hear a raspiness. Um, or you might use the human as the basis for moulage so you can apply the rash or the bruising or injuries. And so when you're treating a person, they actually present uh, the evidence of whatever has happened to them. And then also kind of interesting in a twist, the human actor could be playing a family member, not the patient, and challenging the nurse or clinician to figure out how to deal with a family member emotionally rather than deal with the patient clinically. Um, that, that was a twist that the first time I saw it, it was a hospital in Israel that came up with that. And everyone liked it so well that it kind of spread from there. Um, but that, that is also a standardized patient that's a, that's a family member. And then there's this hybrid combination of the human actor and the mannequin. And if you're from the military community, you've probably seen the combat trauma suit that appears at uh, Itzik regularly, where the person puts on this big chest and there are different organs and blood and stuff in there. So you can actually cut the suit um, while the person lays there writhing and screaming and maybe punching at you or whatever. And so it's very unnerving for one, the person to be exhibiting that kind of emotion, but for two, you've ble been bleeding, bending over them and cutting into the suit, which is so close to being their real body. Uh, if you were in the civilian healthcare community, in, you probably didn't see the cut suit, you probably saw labor and delivery um, combinations where uh, a young woman would play the top half of the body and a mannequin would play the lower half and the baby. And so in the same way, she acts out all of the emotional and physical trauma that's happening to her, uh, but the baby and the, the, the lower extremities are actually part of a mannequin, both very clever uh, implementations. And then um, some of this technology is, especially the mannequin, to a lesser degree, part task trainers, uh, gets expressed more formally by the military in things like the medical simulation training centers, uh, where the, everybody gets dressed uh, in military uniforms. And the scenario that you're in is not civilian, but it's purely military. But you, you see the same kind of thing, um, the same kind of training in the military that you might see um, in civilian EMTs, paramedics, that, that kind of thing. Usually less access to a helicopter. All right. And I think this is where we turn over to Alyssa. Thank you. Um, and then just before we kind of, uh, this is, a, I, I guess, a natural kind of uh, transition point as we're kind of moving away from the physical, more physical simulations and into the sort of virtual, uh, more more virtual uh, kind of simulations. And so I just want to encourage people to post any questions in the Q&A for uh, maybe what, anything that Roger had mentioned that we want to answer um, as we're kind of going along. 
But um, as I as I mentioned, um, you know, we talked a lot about physical simulations, part task trainers, mannequins, maybe even humans, um, and you know, as computer graphics and things like that have have advanced, the medical field has really transitioned to using more screen based simulations, and I think. You know, when we use, talk about screen-based simulations, I would say there's more that more like traditional screen-based simulation, right? Having a computer screen, maybe a phone or a tablet or something like that, um, and those have been have definitely made um, a positive impact, right? For uh, allowing folks to train more knowledge-based tasks, procedural-based tasks, um, and allowing for ease of access to have that computer screen um, in front of you and to experience different scenarios, different environments. Um, but when we're talking throughout the presentation, um, and we talk about this more in the ITSIC presentation about um, screen-based simulations, we also include virtual reality. And that has also been um, kind of created a, a, or had a big impact in the medical field. Um, it offers a lot of really great benefits for, for folks to um, access, again, those environments and those kind of scenarios um, without needing to have be in that actual room or have that actual patient in front of them. Um, it allows folks to have that immersion, right? Um, but it also allows for the, the support staff, the, the trainers, the instructors um, to not have as much burden, right? Having to set up an entire room, bring in the standardized patients, bring in mannequins, potentially set up scenarios that are that are more unique or, or more complicated. Um, and so the medical field has seen a lot of advantages there. So you can see here, um, I think that the one on the bottom right is actually a hand washing simulation, right? And so that is one where you can go and, you, you know, hand washing seems to be such a uh, basic practice, right? But it's an important practice. Um, hand washing and, and hygiene um, was actually a, a huge cause for um, uh, maternal death um, initially. Um, and so, you know, when you go to the hospital, you see someone uh, getting the foam, right? The hand sanitizer or, or washing their hands. Um, that is something that was established not that long ago um, and something that still needs to be practiced potentially. And so um, it's a great opportunity to practice those kind of procedural procedural uh, tasks, um, potentially be assessed on those kinds of tasks, but not needing to have someone hover over you and say, okay, are you washing your hands? Let me see you do it. You know, those folks can go off and they can do something else um, with respect to the trainings. Um, a really good example of this and one that we want to definitely talk about for our folks that um, our DOD folks that that might be listening is TC3 SIM. Um, and so this is actually an application by um, one of the folks here locally in Orlando, ECS, um, where they allow um, they allow trainees to get on their computer, potentially on a virtual reality device and practice uh, more procedural based um, and knowledge based uh, tasks associated with tactical combat casualty care. Um, and so you can see here on the on the, the picture on the right, the, the gentleman that's using it has the, the display on and actually has some haptic devices that he's interacting with. And so he's able to get that tactile feel um, and not just, not just practice the procedural steps, but also get that tactile feel in that immersive environment. Um, and so we're gonna kind of transition into more of that virtual, the virtual simulation as we kind of get into um, the, the steps that the surgical field has taken. Thanks, Alyssa. Yeah, so as Alyssa said, all the way to now, we've basically talked about the exter simulating external um, medical training. So I'm gonna give you some a brief surgical training history just so you know why there's such a need for simulation and surgical training. So the earliest surgical training model is probably the one everyone knows the most is the see one, do one, teach one. And that's that picture that Roger shared earlier where they're all kind of just standing around a cadaver and they're watching. So the next time they have to do it and then the next time they'll teach one. And that really remained the apprenticeship program for a really long time until the residency model was developed, which was more of a competence model. And that's still what we use today. So it allows these surgeons to say years in the training and they get to see multiple hundreds of them. They get to do hundreds of them and then they get to train them as well. So it still follows that apprenticeship model, but it's, it's a much longer and there are several competency checks that are required before they move on to surgery. Um, and then we saw a big shift and a huge need for s simulation and surgical training and education with the introduction of certain technologies and techniques, mainly minimally invasive surgery. So in the 1980s, 1990s, when um, laparoscopic surgery became the go-to way to complete a surgery instead of cutting a large incision, um, 
there was a ton of training that need, was needed. They're all learning this skill at the same time. So there were no experts yet. And the industry uh, that developed this technology or the instrumentation kind of took lead on training this. So they developed what the training should look like. And there was just a huge learning curve you know, they're manipulating longer instrumentation. They're no longer having their hands on directly on the anatomy. They're looking at a 2D screen instead of visually looking directly at the anatomy. So there's a giant learning curve for these surgeons to go through, which created just a huge need for simulation training. Um, fast forward to 2003 and something that really affected the world of simulation training and, and surgery is the restrictions for these residents. So prior to 2003, there were no hourly restrictions. Residents could stay in all hours of the night, 120 hours, work, work, work. And they were able to see so many procedures. They were able to participate in so many procedures. But in 2003, uh, you know, the guidelines said, ACMG said, you know, no more. We're only going to give you 80 hours a work week. I know that seems still seems like a lot. Um, but that cut down the number of hands-on pra practice that they got on, you know, they might only get to do X amount of hysterectomies instead of the amount that they would be able to do in double that amount of hours. So that's when, you know, uh, simulation societies started looking and saying, okay, well, we need to develop more simulation training for these residents so that they're still competent, they still develop their skills before they leave this residency program, but they're doing it in half or a third of the time that they used to spend in the hospital. One step further, it just keeps getting more complicated, was the rise of robotics, um, not only like what you'll see that I'll talk about, but guidance systems and just new technology in the medical field. And again, industry runs that education and they still mainly run that education. So they're developing the simulators, they're collecting the metrics, um, but, these devices are so expensive. A lot of hospitals don't have them. So in order to learn these skills, you need something that you can do outside of the OR to get to acquire those specific psychomotor skills aligned with this technology. And something that we've seen really recently with COVID, um, when COVID hit, the hospitals had to refocus their team and it was no longer surgery as the main main goal, it was to keep these COVID patients alive. So elective surgeries, which could be something, you know, which is anything that's non-emergency. So hysterectomies and, and things like that, they all got put on hold. So all of these residents that were spending, you know, two years in a residency program, three years in a residency program, and COVID has affected two out of three of them or all three of them, they really were getting the short end of the stick and not getting the amount of time that they needed to practice those psychomotor skills. So another increase of simulation in surgery just kind of rolled out with that. So I, I know I mentioned all of these, so I'll just briefly touch, but you know, surgery is being done in one of these two modalities, uh, laparotomy, which is open, and you're making this huge incision, and the surgeon's able to put their hands inside the patient. They're directly visualizing the anatomy. Uh, this is less frequent. It doesn't ha it's, It happens less often. The main type of surgery we're seeing is that minimally invasive or laparoscopic surgery. So that's where we're going to make these tiny incisions. We're going to put these trocars that you can see here on this picture into the patient, and we're going to use long instrumentation with our hands outside of the patient. So now all of my movements are not natural. They're backwards to what I've learned to do with my hands. I'm not looking at the anatomy anymore. Um, I'm looking at a 2D screen. And then even further, you introduce robotic assisted where now you're not even holding an instrument. You're holding a game-like control in some instances. And you're one step even more removed from your patient. And you're manipulating these instrumentation that are attached to a robotic platform. And the skills are that much different than laparoscopic. So. You have to train all of those different skills because if you're a robotic surgeon, you might have to do laparoscopic at some point. And if you're a laparoscopic surgeon, you certainly might have to do open surgery at some point. So because of all of this need and, you know, since the surgical training kind of became an industry problem, there are several societies that said, no, 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 
industry shouldn't be outlining how we train our surgeons. We need to outline how we train our surgeons. So there are a few major societies that came up with simulation programs or uh, that accredit simulation programs. And these four here, American College of Surgeons, Society for Simulation and Healthcare, um, these are the main four that we follow today. And basically they just became the go-to for the standards and guidelines on developing simulation programs, developing the curriculum, following residents' curriculums and objectives, and helping you know both residency programs and also surgeons that have been training for years to develop uh, the right programs for their hospitals. So I'm just gonna go over, Roger kind of hit all the old, the history of stuff. I'm gonna go over what we're using today briefly. So for laparoscopic surgery, um, there's a wide variety of things that you can do to train. Um, it makes sense to just, because they're already looking at a 2D screen, uh, it just makes sense to slip a computer-based uh, simulator in between the surgeon and their anatomy. This way it allows them to have dozens or hundreds of exercises that focus on core psychomotor skills while providing objective metrics back. How much did they bleed during the exercise? How much force did you put on the, the instrument during the exercise? And all of this allows them to be ran at a proctor-free you know, location. So you turn it on, you get to do the exercises, and it provides you with a scoreboard after you're done. Um, often these are used for credentialing and privileging and making sure that you are maintaining that skill. So if you have to go annually back and do simulation, a lot of organizations will require that. Then there are more simple tasks, uh, trainers, like these little boxes. Sometimes you'll see them made out of shoe boxes. I mean, they get really creative, especially with residents. Uh, they don't have very much money, so they'll throw anything together. Um, but they'll use these simple boxes where you just fold it, you get to put those long instruments into the, the patients, the simulated patient here, and then you can use an iPhone or an iPad as that 2D screen, and you're just getting to practice that backwards movement that comes with laparoscopic, and again, not touching the anatomy directly, so that lack of tactile feedback and feel. Um, typically, inside these boxes, you're gonna find something like this. So they can be a one skill device. These are our perk test trainers is what we call them. You know, it's the perk test trainers for surgeons. Um, in the middle, you have like a suturing pad that just allows you to practice suturing over and over. It's super inexpensive, reusable. Um, you have these things that kind of look like roller coasters and craziness. Um, that helps them practice dexterity. So they need to be able to, uh, you know, move their wrist, even if they're, it's a straight stick. How do you move around some of those complicated anatomy? And as more recently, as, uh, as technology continues to grow in the 3D printing world, we'll see that we're able to print one-to-one uh, -one ratios of human anatomy that we can actually have the material where we can cut the material, suture the material. So it allows us to provide a part test trainer that is a one-to-one -one ratio of maybe a congenital heart defect that you might see once in your career, and it allows you to practice on that. And that's something you can't get from a cadaver. We're not promised you know, these special defects when we get this, that kind of tissue. Then there are like more advanced part test trainers for surgery where it takes multiple skills, dexterity, suturing, cutting, and puts it all in one device so that the surgeon can practice a huge range of skills. This specific dome shaped one was actually in efforts from the Fundamentals of Robotic Surgery Program where they basically did a task analysis for all the psychomotor skills needed that are different than lap, different than open, that are specific to robotics. And they house them all on one device so that surgeon can train and test all on this one device. And then of course, you know, we still use tissue, not just cadaveric or, uh, you know, whole animals, but, um, we are often using anything that we that has some kind of anatomical feel to it that feels like regular tissue. Uh, a big reason that we can't ever move away from this in the surgical training department is because cauterization and energy energy application is essential skill in surgery. And this is one of the only things, even though VR is helpful when it comes to knowing where the pedal is and pressing the pedal. How do I know how the tissues react? Did I burn the tissue too much? And is the bleeding stopping? You really have to feel that on tissue so that you can learn that skill. 
Then you enter to robotics. Um, that so Da Vinci is still the most widely used robot uh, that's manufactured by Intuitive. There are several, I mean, Roger has a, a picture that there are, it's covered now with robots that are coming out into the field. Um, but this is the most widely used soft tissue robot to date. And robotics continues to grow because as the older uh, John generation of surgeons kind of move out and the newer millennia move in, they want this type of lifestyle. They don't want to sit over a patient for nine hours doing a laparoscopic case. They want to sit behind a piece of technology and do it. Um, so it's becoming a huge, there's a huge training need for it. Right now, industry runs that training. Um, but there have been a couple companies that have come out and created standalone uh, simulators for the robot itself. And we'll continue to come out with standalone simulators for new robotic platforms. Uh, the robot itself costs over $2.3 million. So once your hospital buys one, it's not likely they're going to let you practice on it. So it has to recoup its investment. So these are a, a lot less, uh, they're more affordable, less expensive, and they provide you with, you know, some of the basic knowledge that psychomotor skills that you need before you go use the actual platform. Uh, one of the best things, just like those laparoscopic simulators, is they provide uh, objective measures for you. So you are you know while you're going through these exercises where you need work and where you've excelled. And it's it's nice for somebody who is a proctor for surgical courses that I don't have to sit there the entire day. I can pull a report, go back to you and say, okay, this is where we need to work on. You know, and two dec decades ago, they did this with uh, laparoscopic simulators, but the medicine community discovered that there is a wonderful opportunity not only to create those virtual reality simulators, but to add them as an integrated part of the robot. So here's two different robotic companies that have both created a something that either attaches to the actual system or is embedded in the actual system. So it allows you to practice those psychomotor skills, but at the highest level of fidelity, you're actually using the console. And this is, from my experience, this is the best way to train them uh, before they get on the actual system and you know start working on cadaveric tissue. The only problem with these integrated systems is it still does require a part of the robot. And again, they're so expensive, um, but it is probably the best training that there is. And I just included this so we can see you know, where we've grown in VR for me um, medical training. This is was a video, but this is just a image of one of those robotic simulators that it, it's a full procedural hysterectomy. So it step by step tells you how to remove um, the uterus and, and finish the procedure. And it gives you guidance if you need it. Um, but I really wanted to show that while, you know, it's getting better, the graphics are getting better. I think the medical simulation world, especially when it comes to VR, we struggle with the fact that the tissue never reacts as tissue should. And there's so many different ways the tissue can react when I cut it, when I when I pull it, when I'm blunt dissecting, um, that you know it does help with the procedural aspects, but you still need that wet real tissue to kind of transfer those skills before you go into real real life procedures. All right. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so I am going to go pretty quickly. This is the this is the issue with trying to put a, uh, a large tutorial into just a, a little bit of time. So I'm going to go pretty quickly because we have some really great questions in the chat that I think that we we definitely want to answer um, and and uh, and have some discussion around. Um, so just just really briefly, um, you know, I think that so I would say last year, last year we actually included AI into our medical tutorial. And I think that this year we're going to have a lot more um, about that. Um, but, you know, I think AI and machine learning, like they're really hot topics, right? Everywhere you go, people are talking about AI and how we can use it, um, how we can implement machine learning. And I think that, you know, one of the, the things I hear the most is um, someone, you know, maybe someone's talking about a problem or something like that. Someone says, oh, I, I bet AI could fix that, right? I bet, I bet uh, machine learning, I bet we could use machine learning to solve that. And I think that, you know, just generally, the truth is that AI can do a lot, right? And I think that it adds a lot of value. 
Um, but it's not necessarily like this blanket solution, at least right now, right, that we can just kind of throw at everything. Um, and I think that it's really good at doing certain things and it's appropriate for doing certain things. And it's been applied um, and proven to be valuable in certain areas. Um, and so, you know, this I think this image is, is a good example of some of the areas of AI um, and medical education and how it can be applied. We've already talked a little bit about robotics, right? Danielle talked about robotics included in that might be some perception um, and things like that. But um, so there are some areas um, and I'm gonna give um, a few specific examples that we can kind of talk through right now. Um, so the first one is AR. Um, and so, you know, I guess AR in itself uh, may not necessarily, you may not think AI, right? Um, AR systems have been really valuable for, again, similar to VR, right? Um, providing um, that realistic environment um, that, uh, you know, that folks can train in. Um, and we've seen a lot of growth in lots of different domains, including in medical for using AR. Um, it allows folks to, uh, you know, see and, and experience some environmental cues that might drive scenarios. Um, it might um, increase the fidelity of the scenarios because of those kinds of things. They might be able to experience situations and um, aspects of a scenario that they might not see very often, right? Um, it also, again, helps with instructor burden potentially um, because they might not have to set up, you know, these full cadavers or these full, um, you know, part test trainers with wet labs and all of these different things. Um, but a huge part of where the value really, really exists is with the, the guidance and the, the um, I would say interactivity of the, of the system, right? Where, uh, you know, it is interacting with the, with the trainee, giving them cues and the trainee is also able to interact with the, with the environment. Um, AR, provides a lot of, uh, or it can provide explicit and implicit cues, right? Explicit cues in like, for example, the, the D and the E here, right? Um, look at this vessel, or um, did you notice this thing? Or maybe you didn't do something quite right. Um, or it can provide a lot of, uh, you know, more implicit kind of cues, right? Bleeding that's kind of over overlaid over top of moulage and is kind of spraying out, right? And then they, they do something right and they're getting that feedback because the bleeding stopped. Um, so AR is providing all of those things, but where AI is really valuable in combination with that, right, is kind of on the back end to uh, to supplement how the graphics and how these overlays and this guidance and the suggestions are being displayed to the user, right? Um, being able to provide those things in an adaptive way, in a realistic way that's really based on uh, and rooted in the physiology that's it, that uh the, the patient is having at that time, or, um, you know, based on what the student did or did not do, um, maybe based on the overarching training goals, um, not just in this scenario, but potentially um, for the job of the person or for their pre based on their previous education. And so allowing AI to kind of drive that simulation and provide more tailored experiences within this really realistic um, environment is really where there's a lot of value. Another area is AI generated training content. Um, and so I think this is really interesting. Um, and the idea here is, you know, allowing using AI to generate more content, more realistic content, whether that be um, maybe avatars, right, that are that are kind of interacting in a space. Um, maybe it's, uh, you know, speech, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. But um, one kind of more interesting example is using AI to generate more content that can then train more AI, right? So, so the example here is um, taking MRIs, x-rays, imaging, imaging uh, 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 content, um, and then generating more content from that, that can then be used to train a model um, uh, to, to be more realistic. Um, this kind of approach can be used to make, um, you know, for example, a tumor, right? Um, to make more, more versions of that same tumor, right? Maybe in a different location, maybe in a different shape, maybe with different characteristics or something like that. Um, one of the questions in the chat from, I think, Annie, let me look. Um, yeah, Annie was actually about um, 3D biome. And I think that's really interesting, right? Um, it's it's not quite that visual training content, right? But it's it's a different kind of training content. But 3D Biome does do some machine learning to um, to try and match up some uh, some of the physiology um, physiology 
that the avatar has, I think, with uh, treatment plans and things like that. But, um, you know, there's certainly an opportunity there for AI to take the content that 3D Biome is is producing um, or is using and to create maybe more avatars, maybe different versions of that avatar um, or provide different um, kind of alternate uh, 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 suggestions and things and to, to really learn from the, all of the data that, it, that uh, something like 3D Biome is gathering. The last one that we're going to talk about is um, smarter mannequins. So, um, you know, this is just one example of um, a speech application, right? Um, and so I don't know if anyone anyone has dealt, how much you've dealt with the mannequins, right? But I know Roger talked a little bit about the, the not really smart mannequins that you just drag around. But there's also these mannequins that... There are, there are also these mannequins, right, that maybe that maybe they do have some speech. Maybe it's pre-generated, right? If this happens, then say this thing. Um, maybe it's actually me in another room with like a one-way mirror and I'm watching you and I'm screaming into it and I'm pretending to be this patient. Um, you know, all of those things are great, but they're not super realistic. They might require a lot of instructor burden, me, i.e. me in the other room screaming and pretending to be a patient, right? Um, and so, you know, the advancements that speech understanding has really been making provides us with the opportunity and has been used um, to make more intelligent mannequins, right? That rely on the situation, re rely on the scenario, rely on the patient's physiology, um, and rely on what the trainee, how what the trainee is saying to the mannequins to generate that language, to understand what's being said for the most part contextually, and then generate an appropriate response and adapt to what is going on in this situation. And so, you know, this is a, a really great opportunity for applying speech here. I'm going to wrap up because I think Roger has a couple more slides too after this. So um, just, you know, there we're in our tutorial, we're planning to give more examples of AI in medical, um, as well as the other, some of the other sections as well. But just something that we want to talk about too is, you know, there are definitely while there are a lot of benefits in AI, there are other things that we're thinking about, right, with how we're really using it. Um, some areas that we want to, to make sure we're considering as we're developing things, um, uh, concepts that use AI, right, are um, black box versus transparency. So, you know, making sure that the instruction and the assessment that we're performing is really um, transparent and understandable to both the students and the instructors, right? We want this to be trusted, we want it to be explainable, and we want um, folks to want to use it and believe that it's doing the right thing for them. Um, privacy over control of data. So, um, you know, while this is for training and education, right? There's not HIPAA data necessarily and things like that, but, you know, making sure that, you know, with all the data that we're collecting, we are, you know, we're collecting lots of data, we're using it in different ways that we are protecting it and keeping it, um, you know, de-identified and, and uh, protect, making everyone feel like we're using the data appropriately. Um, the last two are actually more related to patient care, um, but making sure that uh, physicians understand how to interpret and communicate results to the patients. Um, and making sure that we understand the true liability uh, with relation to AI in, in patient care. Muted, Roger. Okay. The, the question sometimes comes up, are we on a path that leads to uh, purely digital or virtual simulations? And I think the answer is definitely not. Um, there's a lot of hands-on kinds of activities that need to be done. So I think the future has both synthetic tissue and uh, digital tissue in it. So I, I don't think that that's going to change just because digital gets really good. Um, the, the last thing I wanted to point out was how commendably the medical training community responded during COVID. Uh, during that first six months when we were all on lockdown, you saw a lot of people who had training materials that could be applied to COVID, publish them and share them immediately. And so on platforms like Coursera, uh, Stanford and Johns Hopkins and University of Florida and University of Houston, they all started publishing courses that told healthcare workers how to deal with people that were that had COVID. And that, that information came out within a couple of months. And then companies 
um, like ARA's Virtual Heroes, they had a couple of um, game-based simulations that weren't written for COVID, but they were written for respiratory diseases. And so they immediately put those up on their website and outside of a paywall so that anybody could use them to learn about how to treat people with respiratory problems. And then CAE and Laerdal <clears throat> had hundreds, maybe probably thousands of mannequins in the field at training centers, again, that hadn't been programmed with COVID, but that had been programmed with respiratory diseases. And so both of those companies and others immediately published um, instructional guides on how to structure a course to train people on how to treat COVID, even though the mannequin was e exhibiting a more generic kind of respiratory disease. And then there's the WHO courses that are up. The WHO has a website right now with lots of different uh, simulation resources on it. And that all happened like within six months. It was really fast. And I thought it was commendable enough that we wanted to mention that. Um, and finally, unlike military simulation, medical simulation literally has dozens of textbooks published on this topic. Uh, so if you want to learn about any one of the specific nuances of medical simulation, there's probably at least one book that's just about that one specific nuance. There are dozens of them out there. Uh, and that kind of wraps it up. That kind of takes us to our discussion um, we've been typing answers to questions in the sidebar as we were going along. And one question came up ahead of time, and it also came up in the sidebar. And I think Alyssa and Danielle and I all have something we want to contribute on that. And it was specifically about what role does um, or how can simulators be used with specific metrics to assess the performance of a clinician? Uh, whether that clinician is a nurse or a physician or a surgeon, can, are we at a place and can the simulators actually measure performance and make a decision or suggest a decision about the competency of that clinician? Um, that has been a very, I'll, I'll go first. There, that has been a very touchy topic for a few decades because simulators, if you go back a decade, were very primitive and they were always accused that the simulator measures the things that it's easy for a digital simulator to measure, not the things that are important for a clinician to measure. It's be, it, so the things that were easy to measure, like how many centimeters did your instrument tip move, that was a metric, but whether you were carelessly throwing it about in the body space, that wasn't a metric, which is the one that the clinicians wanted to know about. So traditionally, they didn't trust the simulators to do assessment. They wanted to do it um, personally or from a human point of view. Um, but that's starting to change. And so since I changed, shared the kind of negative holding it back perspective. I thought maybe Danielle could share the positive. Danielle's the only one of the three of us who's still working in civilian health care. Uh, Alyssa and I kind of left and went to defense. So she so, could yeah, share a I mean, positive perspective. In civilian health care, we're very slow <laughs> to adopt technology like simulation for things like Roger said. They want the surgeons to still have their say, the clinician to still have their say. And while the it's not gone. Like he said, it is getting better. And I think it's just kind of marrying them together with other assessments. So they're not going to just take, if I put them on a simulator and, and they do five hours of simulation, then they're like, okay, check, he's good to go. But there's a pathway now that they require when it comes to privileging and credentialing in different areas. So with a new technology, whether it's robotics or, you know, even if it's a new pacemaker device for insertion or whatever, whatever it may be, there's usually a pathway of assessment that they'll require. Um, it usually starts, usually, in our organization, it does start with simulation. So there are metrics that they require. Those are the metrics that Roger said that the simulator just gives us that are easy to use. And then after that step in stone, then it's like, okay, now you're going to do this many cases proctored, and we're going to record them, and we're going to give you metrics that way. 
then you can do the case by yourself with somebody else proctoring, you know, helping you, and then you're good to go and move on. So I think it's a part of the assessment, but it's definitely not enough to check the boxes and continue on. Alyssa, do you have anything to add that I might have missed? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, simulation and I'll say, you know, very much virtual simulation, things like that, like, um, it has really made it possible, right, to object to, to it, it has created a platform for us to measure training and training skill, uh, you know, the skills that are being kind of acquired. And I think that I think, Danielle, you said it, it's it's about the right using the right thing at the right time, right, doing what is appropriate for the situation, for the for the instructor, for the trainees. Um, and, you know, we, we have definitely all seen uh, physicians or I would say the medical field been a little resistant, right, to, to implementing these things and to kind of change, move away from what is traditional, right, um, paper-based kind of checklists and things like that. But I think that working in partnership with, it's really important, you know, as you're kind of developing simulations or technologies to to work really closely with SMEs, right? Work with the right people and implement the things that they're already doing um, and kind of find that that sort of um, that partnership there and that kind of bridge from the traditional way and into kind of the new way. And I think that with kind of it more intelligent systems and, you know, better sensing technologies and things like that, um, we are able to assess some of those I'll say not, you know, not the the inches that you moved, but the, you know, are you are you doing something kind of wacky? And, and we're able to kind of get more interesting data around that. And we can kind of move towards having assessments there. Um, and I think with Brian, I think Brian had mentioned something about, you know, modeling knowledge and competency and readiness. I think those are the those are kind of like big word, not big words, but you know, they're they're bigger concepts, right? Modeling some a competency um, of someone is is kind of complicated. And I think that some of the 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 work that that folks are doing in the space of AI is really pushing that forward. Um, and we've been able to do that in other fields. And I think that it's you know, maybe it'll take a little work, but I think that the medical space could really benefit from something like that. Well, so far, this has been the easiest Tech Connect webinar I've ever done because I haven't had to spur questions, stimulate questions, fill gap time at all. <laughs> but in our remaining few minutes, I want to get each of you to just uh, comment on you know, kind of where this all seems to be leading in the buzzword of the, the year, which is metaverse, right? In fact, uh, one of our next events in Tech Grove, we're kicking off our Mixology series. You know, Tech Grove, we have our juice bar, now we're going to have our mixology. And we're bringing in uh, technical folks from each of our government customers, from industry and from academia, and we're just going to pose the question, what's the metaverse? And see the difference in their perspectives and, and how they view where this is all going. From the three of you, let's wind this up with, what's this thing called the metaverse? and How's it going to affect medical simulation and training? Well, if I move fast, I can go first. <laughs> um, I think the medical community doesn't know what the doesn't know the metaverse exists yet, uh, except for when they go home and watch television or browse the web. I don't think that it's a it's on their radar yet. Um, from a critic's point of view, skeptic's point of view. Um, I would ask, what is the metaverse? So we had uh, Second Life a decade or more ago. Does the metaverse look different than that? No. The metaverses that are being pushed by Facebook and Sandbox and Decentraland that I've seen, um, their, their graphics are, are not equal to Second Life more than 10 years ago. And you can't do anything in those metaverses that you couldn't do in Second Life. Now you do it in a different way. You can buy clo digital clothing and you can pay for it with cryptocurrency instead of arranging to pay for it with real money. Um, so it's n the, the digital, what you're looking at is not that different. Um, if you're using VR, are the VR goggles that you put on your face now any different than the VR goggles we put on 10 years ago? No, they're the same. A little bit better resolution, but they're the same. 
but I was having this discussion with somebody online and they did point out, they said, you know what we don't have now, we didn't have then. The goggles you put on your face, one, they can have cameras on the outside so they can create an AR-like experience. Okay, so that's new. And you can put eye trackers on the inside and use that eye looking data for something. Now what, I don't know what you would use it for, but you can use it for something. Um, and you can use the AR piece also for hand tracking. Uh, so maybe you could be tracking your hands and maybe other objects too. Uh, the military might say a rifle. We might say a scalpel um, in the, with the, the cameras on the outside. So for me, um, half of it is just a repeat of what we all experienced 10 to 15 years ago. And that little part about glasses, eye tracking and hand tracking, that was something that I had to concede that's new. I don't know quite what to do with it yet, but it's new. That's what I have to share. I can, I can go next. Yeah, I can go next. Um, I, you know, I don't know if I have, I guess my, my main opinion on, on metaverse and uh, medical is, you know, I, I think, you know, I guess I think about COVID, right, where now, you know, we've all been at home and, you know, we've really relied on things like Teams and Big Marker and things like that to have access to each other, right? And um, I think that, you know, maybe a virtual space like Metaverse might be interesting for providing access, right? I'm thinking about patients, you know, access to care, access to interactions with, with providers, um, and maybe in the training space as well, right? Access to training and access to, uh, you know, access to training that you might otherwise not be able to um, but part of that and what I'd be interested to see is, you know, obviously it provides you the virtual access, but in order to access that, you have to have the technologies like headsets and things like that. And so, you know, what I'm really, I guess, interested in seeing as that kind of moves forward is how we're going to make access to this accessible space for everyone, right? And making it cost efficient and um, I don't have a VR headset in my house. So, um, you know, uh, are we going, how are we going to make it so that everyone can really take advantage of this? Is, this is something that we want. So that's, that's my, I guess, my thoughts on it. Yep. And Danielle. Yeah. So I don't have much to add because like Roger pointed out, I am in medicine and we don't think about that. <laughs> um, uh, but as Alyssa kind of spoke and she said, you know, maybe for patient facing, I think maybe something that we from a clinical standpoint can never quite do as well is team training and getting everybody in the right place at the right time and maybe having access to something like that for a team training perspective mm -hmm. would be big. That is where I think we try and we push for that, but um, we lack in team training in the clinical aspect just because it's hard. It's hard to get them all in the right. same place. It's hard to get them get into a simulated OR room. It's hard to simulate a trauma and have everybody engaged and involved. So, I mean, if I had to guess with little experience in that area, I think that's some place that it could be beneficial. Thank you all. Your responses, I completely agree. And you know, seeing the breadth and the depth and the extent of what's been going on with particularly military modeling simulation and training for decades, there's a reason we titled one of our recent events, Military MSMT is the metaverse, has been, is, and will be, right? I, there's just so much that's been created in this space that is uh, comprises and really defines, I think, you know, what the metaverse is, but the rest of the world's paying attention. So thank you all for your time today. Thank you to those of you who joined us and stayed with us for a few extra minutes. The recording of this webinar will be posted on the NTSA events page in a day or two. You will get an email letting you know that it is available there. And I encourage you to go back and watch some of our previous Tech Probe Connect webinars as well. And stay tuned, follow us on LinkedIn and watch your, your uh, NTSA emails for our September webinar, which will be Advanced Air Mobility Tutorial. So that one should be fun too. Roger, Alyssa, Danielle, look forward to seeing you at ITSIC 2022 and hearing what new things you have to tell us. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.